Hi, welcome back to Chasing Squirrels. The uh, the, the the connection that I've made today, I'm I'm, I'm pretty excited to have the com- conversation. Uh, the main feed for me to get connected with guests is usually through through Twitter and other socials. Doug, who I'm talking to today, it was a little bit inverted. I had a, I had an article, I guess it was a blog post forwarded to me. It was a forward after a forward after a forward. And it was, it was one of his pieces from earlier this year that I would encourage anyone to, to give a read, but it, it, it spoke, it's spoken in, in, in such a, a clear fashion to sort of the challenges of, I guess, being a dad, being a teacher, um, and, and how those, those two spheres sometimes connect, overlap, and the, the reflective practice that can happen between the two. So that got me, that got me interested. You know, when, when there, there's a whole lot of feed that we get looking at socials, and sometimes it can be just a little bit of clickbait to sort of go through to the next and the next and the next. But this, this gave me pause to, to check out more about my guest today. And so I, I, without too much prefab intro... Doug, can you throw down an intro for yourself? Hey, yeah. Uh, my name is Doug Robertson. I taught at fifth graders up in Portland, Oregon. I guess it's down for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm in my 13th year of teaching, I think. Uh, I've written four books. Three of them are about teaching. Two of them are serious about teaching. Uh, He's the Weird Teacher and A Classroom of One are my two serious books. The second one's more about mentor teaching and student teaching. Uh, the jokey book is the teaching text. You're welcome, and that's mostly written because teachers never get funny books about teaching. If you want to read about, you want to still want to be a nerd and you want to read about teaching, but you don't want to be inundated with a bunch of data and stuff, then this one will not teach you anything about teaching. It'll just make you laugh, which is something that we all need, I think, when it comes to the job. And then the last one is called a. Um, the Unforgiving Road. I forgot where I was. Uh, the Unforgiving Road, and that's a that's a novel. That's a post apocalyptic novel. So that's kind of who I am. Um, I do a lot of writing. I put words onto the internet on a regular basis, and I teach, and that's what I do. I love the uh, I love the the angle that you kind of come at that is sort of like the being the being the nerdy teacher, and it's it struck me like in reading your feeds and the humor that that flows into those feeds um it's important to sort of pay attention to what's happening between the comedy because if if i were to jump in and out of some of your posts very very quickly without due diligence there's that humor is i you know what I, i'm gonna say this i don't know i'll throw it down like when i read your stuff it's it's like douglas adams-esque <laughs> like I get this kind of sense, like you're 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 touching on the real, like the 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 grain of what's going on. But I just I love the way that you frame. I love the way that you write. I really do, and I think that was part of um, that was part of what drew me to read more of your your blog posts. But it also uh, kept me sort of moving from just like social feed to to feedback to wanting to communicate with you. Um, and this, I, and I do believe at the heart of it with what this, you know, at the end of the day, I haven't grabbed your books. I haven't grabbed your books yet. Totally open to checking them out. But what I suspect I'm going to find there is, like I said, that there, it is about the teaching, but it's also making sure that it's, it's kind of dealt with in a human fashion because yeah, I just, I really dig the comedy that you throw down in your, your Twitter posts and I can see how, within your blog posts, you do something similar, um, long form, you got more area to stretch your legs, but I love the comedy. Is that easy for you to bring to teaching? Is that a natural sort of like baseline for you when you look at what you do as an educator? Um, well, first, thank you so much. The Adam's S thing is, is a ridiculous compliment that I totally don't deserve, but I appreciate it a lot. Um, the, the comedy is it's, it, it ha- I don't know any other way to communicate, frankly, um, and that's not me saying that I am naturally hilarious and it's very easy for me to be funny uh, <laughs> because it's not com- – um, ask anybody, ask any actor, mostly comedians, they will tell you that comedy is harder than drama. Uh, it's much easier to make somebody cry than make somebody laugh. Um, 
but it's, it's just, it's how I think and it's how I communicate. And when you say somebody like Douglas Adams or Terry Pratchett, uh, those are people that are in my DNA. I grew up reading them. So that's, I, I don't think I have a choice at this point when it comes to, when it comes to writing and when it comes to speaking. And hopefully um, those two things run very, very parallel. I, I, one of the things that I have worked really hard to do is cultivate my writing voice in a way that feels like we're kind of hanging out. I, that's what I want. I want it to feel very conversational. I don't want it to feel formal. You get a lot of teaching blogs. Um, and I really like what you said about feed to feedback. That's a cool way to think about it. You get a lot of teaching blogs that feel like a direct line to you. And this is one way. And I kind of want it to feel my stuff to feel more like open to conversation. I want us to go back and forth with this kind of stuff. And humor is a great way to to, to open that door because, oh, it's, he's talking about teaching, but there's also a Harry Potter joke in here. And I also like Harry Potter. So I feel like we can have a conversation. He's not just lecturing at me um, or being very pedantic about stuff. And that ties into the, the human fashion thing that you were saying too. And of course, all of that plays into my classroom. And what's really nice about that is most of the time, fifth graders are a much easier audience than adults. Um, and I don't know if that's like a power dynamic thing. I'm the teacher. So they have to laugh at my jokes, just like every boss thinks that he's hilarious because my employees laugh at my jokes. Um, or if I'm genuinely funny, I know, well, actually, you know what? I know that I'm fairly funny sometimes because fifth graders will also just look at you like for a really long time silently after you make a joke while you're waiting for them to laugh and they won't. And that's always fun. <laughs> you, you know what though? No. Cause okay. So my context, I'm a high school teacher and the, I work with students on suspension and expulsion. So my, my audience is, I get a constant turnover, um, but they also come from several different high schools. So we're, it's our, my, my board is divided up into four regions and each one of the regions has uh, a classroom like mine, if you will, an alternative classroom. And so building the rapport, building that rapport step, that connection where the kids get you. I often find I have to do things that mystify them. I have to do <laughs> things that make me more complex in order for them to kind of get me. And I, I think that was other, another part of this whole, I got to talk to Doug because leaving them slightly, I, I, I was saying to someone else in another conversation, I love in some ways um, treating my students or treating my students to a, a sensation like they're a human post-it note and they need to connect with each other to kind of really get what's going on here. So kind of like leaving a little bit of a mystery with one kid and then I walk over and I work with another kid and then I walk away and I watch to see, are they tracking back to me to sort of clarify or do they actually connect with each other? That's, I like that. That's cool. Yeah. And, but, but I, but you probably do that, right? Like it's, you can confuse the class and get a good sort of like learning moment out of it. And I would agree. Like my, I see a change. I see a real difference between my own children. My daughter's in grade four. She's approaching that space where, it's really important for her to not only be a, let's say a student, do the stuff that students do, whatever that might be, but also to understand the teacher. They've shifted out of that space where the, just the person at the front is telling them things to do. She's starting to shift into wanting to understand the backside of that. Why, why is that teacher asking me to do it in that way? So I can only imagine the grade fives are slightly more ninja that way. So if they're throwing down, you know, the blank stares, that moment of silence, that's good. So I think that's a sweet spot because that liberates you, man. Like you could do any, like start juggling at that point and then just yeah, walk out the um, door. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I really like teaching upper grade. I've only ever taught upper elementary, um, which in my case means third, fourth, fifth, and sixth over the over the career that's where i've been and i really like fifth grade because just like you were saying they're they're starting to get you on a more human level and they're starting to understand that you exist independent of the classroom it's like that whole joke of like no my teacher sleeps 
in the classroom. <laughs> and then when the student sees them in the grocery store, they're a little shocked. Like you're seeing a zoo animal out in the wild. Like, Oh my God, what are you doing here? Um, so they, they, they do start to connect on a more human level. And I think that makes things a lot more fun and a lot more interesting. And it's a lot easier to build those relationships because you can talk to them you can talk to them like they're people when they're kindergartners. That's not exact. That's not what I mean. But they're they have the maturity level to talk to them like they're people, and then they talk to you like you're a people, and you kind of build that relationship. I think a little deeper and a little easier because there's more to them, if that makes sense. And I'm not saying that there's not a whole lot to little ones. They're just not as in touch with it. Um. And then, yeah, the post-it notes idea is great. I love l- exactly what you were saying. You sprinkle the knowledge around, and then you kind of make them make them work for it. And I work very hard to make sure my class does not see me as the font of all knowledge because they still come to me, and they're like, what does this word mean? And they're like holding the textbook when they ask me. And I'm like, if only, if only there was a place – in the book with all of the words in the book in it that had the definitions. What would you call that? I would call that the glossary. No, that's a terrible name for it. I would call it the place in the back of the book with all of the words in it. And by the time I finish that, they've rolled their eyes and walked away from me and are using the glossary to look it up. (laughs) Mr. Robertson, what does this thing mean? And my class is one-to-one. So like sitting in front of a Chromebook, if only there was a box with all the answers in it. What would we call it? What could we call it? <laughs> Their eyes are rolling and they're just ignoring me and they're doing they're doing it for themselves. It's like, good, that's what I wanted. Don't come to me and ask. You have the you have the means in front of you. Come to me to help you interpret it when you don't understand the definition that you get because you're going to google it and then click on the very first link and it's going to be a bad answer. I had one student one time, I and this is e- I love overhearing too. And I'll, I'll shape that a little bit. Like I've had students, new students come in and I hear them say to the student beside them, I can, yeah, what's, what's this thing about? What's the quadratic thing? So they're sort of talking to the kid beside them. And then, and then the student asking the question will say, uh, I'm just going to go ask Clough. And the student they were asking, who's been with me a little bit longer, I have heard the kid say, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. And and the kid's like, why is the teacher? And then the other kid will go, all right, I warned you. Because <laughs> one of the mistakes I love making mm-hmm. is answering the obvious question. I, I love it. It's just, I love it. I'm like, it's like T-ball to me. You, you sort of set it right up in, in front and I'm going to take a big fun swing at it, but I'm going to make sure that it's catchable. I'm not going to go out of the park. I'm not going to blast it. I'm going to drop it just near the fence line. And we're going to run and I'm going to run beside you the whole time, still chatting at you. Yeah. Or the students that, you know, walk up with the textbook and my lead sometimes will be, okay, you got to walk with me, walk with me, walk. If you want to ask, you have to walk with me. And then I'll go into a place that they can't follow. <laughs> so they, so it's timelined, right? You know, like in, you know, they stop you in the hallway. Oh, I got to ask you about that. And I'm like, okay, if you want to ask, I'm totally open, but you got to walk with me and I'll be listening, listening, listening. And I accelerate a little bit. And then I just go right into the staff bathroom. <laughs> So they come to know that the time that you spend together is important. Come with your best stuff, you know, come, come with your best. And I do the redirect like with you. Like I love those. I'll even sort of, it's, it's, I will tell you the beard helps. So I've been, I've been sporting the beard for a while because often when I'm imagining, you know, what could Google, Google Omnibox, uh, glossary, like you're sort of doing this. <laughs> yeah, stroke the beard. The beard. Exactly. You have to. Yeah. yeah. And then you get to the point and then you do the one last stroke. And if they're still making eye contact with you, that's when I start juggling. I just change activity. I'll do something <laughs> entirely different. Like you didn't answer the question. I'm like, I know it's a tough question. Now, what's so funny about this conversation is that it's, it's so anti like the, um, the stereotype teacher movie teachers that you see that I get, you know, when you get student teachers or, or young teachers coming to you, they're like, no, you use, you, you stand and deliver. You have dangerous minds and you, you cradle them and you help them and you give them everything that they need. And you're like, that was a movie. 
Dude, I was actually, I was hoping you're going to throw down, I wanted you to throw down one more principle, uh, one more sort of movie trope. I thought you're going to either go to the principal or one of those other ones. That was <laughs> awesome. It's so tropey. It's, you know what? But here's the thing, right? Like you, if you, I get this, I get that moment, that, 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 that nugget that you're just stomping on right now. I get that when I, depending on how the, my frame of mind looking at different socials. So I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the um, picturesque postings of classrooms that seem so homogenous in a different direction. I just think, yeah, but that's not my context. That's not my context. That's nicely. That's a lot of color. That's nicely organized. Yeah. You got whiteboard space. Like I, I have that exact same response to the tropes of teaching and I love, you know, reverse engineering them to at least have a discussion about how it became a thing. How did that assumption become a thing? Why is it that you think you, you know, you teach better standing at a lectern as opposed to sitting on the carpet with your kids? Mm. You know, why, how have you, how, what's your system of noticing learning? You know, is it the standard test or is it the conversations or is it how you feel your emotional state when you see a child light up because they've got it? Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be anything. You know, even if they understand that they no longer ask you where the glossary is, they get it, they walk away and they actualize it. Right. And then that kid is the kid sitting beside my students saying, don't ask, mm -hmm. me. don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> I like that you brought in the teacher candidate thing. Um, you, I, I'm, I, I don't, what, what book flat out, what book should, which of your teacher books should I get first? Oh no. Uh, it depends on what you want. If you want the, the more overview one then he's the word teacher that's the first one um but if you are having a student teacher then you want um a classroom of one that's the one that's specifically written for the mentor teacher student teacher experience so okay i i was i was i i've never had a teacher candidate i've supported teacher candidates i've never never had one of my own uh my context i think makes it challenging i've been in a lot of small space a lot of niche teaching so small classrooms. I, I, I've had a lot of what I would say in some ways are a little bit like Navy SEAL position. So within guidance, spec ed, altern alternative education, and now working with students on expulsion or suspension. So it's, it's hard. It's hard to sell that to faculty. Mm -hmm. um, I think often in, in that this was, this is something that may be particular to secondary. They're coming as curriculum specialists still there's, which is a whole other that can be part two of yours and my podcast <laughs> if you want to do another one because really all the stuff that so prior to becoming a teacher i was a chef so i came in as a tradesperson. Uh, i had the fortune of being able to go to university which working as a cook paid for so you know i come out with a, a ba and when i decided to apply to faculty here it was really easy for me to get in like having me having trades papers and having a degree, they're like, come on in. That's like, that was just a really perfect mix at the time. What that opened up for me though, is to be able to work in a lot of different spaces. Cause if I came in with just my trades papers, I would have never been able to teach what would be considered like core, core uh, courses. I could have only done different trades, but it's hard to get a, um, it's hard to get someone from faculty to come work with me because they're looking to come in and work with an English teacher or they're looking to come in and work with a math teacher. But the niche spaces are the where the really cool stuff happens. So I, I think that's my instinct is to check out your the one that speaks to that. For a particular reason, I hope it won't be a spoiler from your book, but here's the thing that I want to put to you. I got to be honest, I'm going to get one of them. I was just curious whether or not, you know, if you would go prescriptive on me, say, Clough, if you want, if you want the one that just as a, a, a checkout thing, like check this one out. That's cool though. Probably I'll do the candidate one. Here's my here's my question. It's around the stuff that can be learned but can't be taught. And you you got a video out on YouTube that has the exact same "you're welcome" <laughs> kind of uh, consolidation step. You know, the homework is "you're welcome." You're welcome. I did this for you. You you should fully appreciate the effort here. And you sort of go through the the, uh, the bits or the, the trials, survivor-esque trials that you, you put, I, I'm, I'm assuming that was one candidate, you know, one candidate in particular that was, you know, having a good time with it too. But it, it's given me, it's given me moment to think about the stuff that 
the teacher candidates just they need to observe and test drive but as a teacher what is it called on your end like what are you in that frame you have the teacher candidate what are you mentor teacher what's your t- yeah mentor teacher okay. is what we're called is that the, the, the-, the universities call us cooperating teachers oh okay um, but we are called i think in their system we're cooperating teachers but then to the to the student teachers we're the mentor to i hate cooperating teacher i don't like the term i don't uh, get i don't get the phrasing i, I yeah. it sounds like we're doing them a favor yeah or the system a favor and i don't i think that's a bad place oh you're cooperating with us that's so nice of you i think that's a terrible place for us to even just frame i'm big on language so it's a bad place for us to frame that relationship oh we're cooperating with the universe no we're we're in this together. It's not a cooperative. It's not just a cooperative handshake. There's, It's deeper than that. So I really like mentor teacher. So I, I'm going to put two things together then. So one of the, so the, the question still stands, the, you know, what, some of the things that you've looked at that are really challenging for a teacher candidate to be taught. So that idea of a conveyance of knowledge, we're going to, I'm going to make it as dressed down and standardized as possible. Where it shows that you are cooperating, Doug. That's that's basically you can tick the box. I cooperated because I taught the uh, the teacher candidate this. But I want to put together another concept about that oversimplification of the relationship. What have you observed in that? That either was you know challenging on your end to kind of get that candidate the experience, or was challenging on the candidates side to kind of wrap their head around um um a lot of okay that's uh, i just need a second because that's kind of a big question so i'm going to talk and make face noises while that's my good brain you got a beard stroke it buddy processes exactly <laughs> you could add you could add a slightly 45 degree stare off into space oh, yeah, the, the, you can't go all the way quizzical dog head tilt you got to go just before that yeah just a tilt uh, well, let's go. Let's go back slightly. So I've had a couple of student teachers now, and it's by far the most valuable experience I've ever had as a teacher. I had a student teacher back when I taught in Hawaii, um, two student teachers, and I had one last year and an alternate last year, and I've got one this year and an alternate this year, and it's it's better than any professional development that that you can possibly go through because kind of the nature of being a mentor teacher, at least as far as I'm concerned, is you have to explain everything that you're doing. Every, and like literally all the stuff that you don't think about in your classroom, they, they don't have that instinct yet. So you really have to explain like, why did I stand here while I was teaching that lesson? Why did I move over here? Why did I give them seven sentences instead of five uh, five sentences? Like you really got to break it down all the way. And I think about like, um, I always think about Star Trek because I'm a giant nerd, but it's pretty much any show where there's like this highly technical thing. So like uh, in a cop show, like a forensics show, when one character will look at the other character and say, well, Next, what we're going to do is we're going to get the DNA and we're going to run it through the sample and then we're going to run it through the database and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that. Because at the end of those monologues, he should always look at the other character and go, but you know that because you work here. Hmm. Like I just over explained something that in real life I would not have to over explain because you work here too and you do this every week. That's what we do as mentor teachers. We're constantly doing, but you know that because you work here, except they don't know that yet because they've only worked here for a week. Um, and so that, that, that video that you're talking about is, is kind of a funny jokey thing that Veronica last year's student teacher and I um, came up with um, just like a Rocky esque training montage of this is how you become a teacher. So I've got her like pushing desks across the room and running wind sprints to the bathroom and, um, giving f- grading feedback, and then I'm shouting at her about her grading feedback and like all of this stuff that was really fun. And she was, um, that was late into our our time together, and she was way on board. She was she was like the perfect student teacher. She was um, 
we, we, we connected very early and very well. She was great. And uh, now she has her own classroom and she's, she's doing great uh, teaching fourth grade somewhere else. i um, super proud of her. So the, the challenge when you're, when you have a student teacher and you're trying to be a mentor teacher, I think is, is finding the line between breaking everything down like that. And then it's, it's exactly like student, te- like, like teaching, teaching, like the operative word in both of those phrases is teacher. So at some point with your students, you have to say, Oh, if only there was a place in the glo- in the glossary. And at some point with your mentor te- or your student teacher, you kind of have to step back. And I'm very explicit with them. And I tell them, I, I'm going to let you plan a lesson that I know is not going to work like you think it's going to work. And I'm not going to tell you that it's not going to work. And I'm going to let you teach it. And it's totally okay because I'm going to be in the room. So if anything catches fire, I'll be there to catch it or to put it out. Uh, when you break the classroom, we can put it back together after lunch. It's totally fine. Um, but I'm not going to let you know that it's happening. You have to recognize that. And that, that instilling that sense of that, that sense of failure, which is kind of a buzzword now, but it's also an important, it, it's so annoying when like really important concepts become these oversimplified buzzwords. Failure is good. Okay. Most of the time, sometimes not so much. Um, And then the failure that, like, failure is good people are describing and actual failure are two very different things. Um, But that's a whole other, that's a whole other rant. Um, But then letting the student teacher fail. And then it's like as a teacher slash mentor teacher, that's a weird place to be because I have a responsibility to these kids and I know they're not getting the best lesson. And I have a responsibility to this student teacher. And I know she's not giving the best lesson. So neither group right now is getting what they need, but they're both also getting kind of exactly what they need. Mike, I have my kids every day, all day long. I can, we can redo this lesson. They'll be fine. My student teacher needs to crash and burn. This is how she's going to learn. It's the scene in Monty Python. The castle falls down into the swamp and sinks. Castle falls down into the swamp and sinks. But the last castle, that stayed up. Um, She needs her castles to fall into the sink for a while, uh, into the swamp for a while. So she has a good foundation to actually build a castle on. Does that make sense? Totally. you, You made me think a bunch of different things. One, those are the posts that really catch my attention in any space, whether it's a, you know, a, a teaching blog or some, if there's an Insta, like wherever I'm looking for those where it's not, where it's not, the polish isn't what speaks. It's that where you can so clearly tune into the experience that was created there. Um, the second thing, <laughs> you make me think about boiled frogs for some reason. <laughs> and that whole analogy of, except it's like, it, it's medium rare. We're not going to well done. <laughs> We're, we're, we're just we're just taking it to that level where um, there's a slight there's an uncomfortableness to it and we're just gonna we're gonna simmer mm. here for a while right it's, it's not gonna take you out but it's gonna get uncomfortable as soon and the thing is the only way it doesn't get uncomfortable is if it actually goes all the way through to boiled frog because that is the perfect example of not not noticing at all that something is a little bit off the rails right and student teachers need to learn that feeling now because i exist in that field i'm constantly like i have no idea if this is going to work this is probably going to fail oh dude i don't know if this is going to be okay but i'm 13 years in so at this point i'm okay with that and i've also like got that that specific kind of mindset where i'm okay with it anyway like not every teacher who's been teaching for a while is okay with it and i'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing i'm not passing judgment i'm just a lot of people need to be trained into the idea that I don't know if this is going to work and that's okay. And that's a place where we need to be as teachers without threatening people. You need to be taking risks or you're dying. You need to be pushing yourself or you're hurting your students and they're never going to succeed. No, just baby steps towards risk until you feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable. Like you're saying, the the raw, not raw, uh, the medium, medium, medium rare. rare boiled frog. <laughs> <laughs> Delicacy. That's a great 
you uh you um i i love i love that as a leap off um but um you 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 posted that uh you like to paint your nails yes and uh i love every th- bit little bit of thought and your post and the implication and the whole idea of how powerful small change can be to motivate kind of big thinking. And, and the challenge then sometimes is just to, what is that little small thing that you can do? What's, what's the little trigger? What's the little action? What's the little noticing that you can do that can really create dynamic and fascinating relationships, conversations. And I, I, I read that post about you painting nails and its purpose and power. Um, I was wondering if you could, if you could speak to it for a bit, because I think it's, it's my school board right now is, is well, okay. Many school boards are my school board has in the past, but the, the idea of, um, creating equitable spaces where it's, you know, and I don't even want to make it about the learning, but just where everyone feels like they have a piece of the pie and they can exist. I read that post and I thought, this is a, this is, this is source code. This moment is a bit of a source code moment about what you bring of self in order to accelerate other people into good spaces too um well first i'm coming on this podcast every week um <laughs> if you're just going to talk about how wonderful my posts are that's I, i'll book <laughs> I, i'll book you uh, like i said i got more stuff i don't you know i i I've, I've been told that in general about the sort of 45 to you know one hour is the taller taller so i can book you in for another we can do weeklies dude you want to do weeklies let's do weeklies. <laughs> as long as you keep telling me how wonderful i am um so I, I will I will include that. I, yeah, if that's the bait, if that's the bait. If that's the, <laughs> I'm very that's simple. The, the, Flattery will get you everywhere. Um, uh, and and so, but but walk me through that because it's. I do think that this is. I was talking to someone the other day, and I said to them, "We're we're talking about um, you know, it was kind of like it was Clef. Why do you podcast? What are you doing? And I just look at this as like an extended reflective practice. That's all it is. And the more stuff I learn, I may kind of expand my mind, but it becomes more confusing to be in my own context. In, in a lot of ways. And, and I said, what I find often is that when I reach out to someone and I kind of mention to them, I've noticed a thing. Um, many times I get back like, really, you want me to talk about this? Like, this is, this is talk worthy. And when I saw your post, that's what it becomes. This is, this is talk worthy. It's, it's, in, it's a, a simple conversation that has really positive and complex uh, possibilities. So if that's, if that's just one more compliment, so be it. But I think it's a necessary, the, the most dangerous places to not talk about stuff like this. Absolutely. Um, as far as the, I'm going to skip around a little bit. Um, as far as things that we do that are talk worthy, I think that we as teachers do not in appreciate the little things that we do and understand how talk worthy so many of those things are um, and how vital and important even little things that we do can be for others um i'm not like big on the twitter's the greatest professional development ever bandwagon but it is one of those things that i really like about twitter is that sometimes you share this random little thing and somebody else is like that's exactly what i needed to hear that's exactly what i need and like those those little human moments of teaching are are great and that's uh, in and i'm not trying to sell my book but in in the new book um classroom of one one of the things that i talk about early in the book is you can hear my child in the background being very upset about a game sometimes when you ask a teacher why they're not a mentor teacher i don't have anything to share that's a terrible place Mm -hmm. to be coming from of course you have something to share you don't think that you have anything to share because part of teaching uh, and there's a lot of reasons for this. And um, somebody, a woman named Jen Binnis is a great resource for getting into that a little deeper. Um, we are kind of trained to think that we're not as special as we are and we don't have as much to share. And I think a lot of that comes from where teaching started and how it's a very female dominated profession and all of those other things that like society plays into trying to make you feel less than. 
Um, but we very much have talk worthy things. It's why more people should be submitting for conferences. It's why more people, diverse people should be writing books. We don't need another book by a white guy. By the way, I'm a white guy. Please buy my books. Um, no, you know what? Can, can I pause you on that just for one sec? Because I think that's, that's, that's a, I, I get the conflict. I definitely, and then that idea of sort of, cre- I think, I think you can have both minds and especially when you sort of demonstrate a little bit of that kind of comedic schizophrenia that you just threw down on because it, it cre- what it automatically does. It's just like, it's just like what you do with your students and I do with mine. Jeez. I wonder what would be a really great way to promote others. What would be that conversation? And, and, you know, if I, if only someone would name drop an individual insert person that you're imagining right now, and you do mm-hmm. that in public spaces. So I, I get, I get the sort of conflict, but I also get like, again, a talk worthy conversation. What if we're sort of revealing our thinking that way in a way that's not just, it's not just revealing our own sort of conflict, but you're also tapping, you're hat tipping other people in that exact same space. So it makes it confusing for the audience. Geez, does he want to do this conference or did, did, wait, what did he just tell us? I don't know. You know, it's, I think that's important to leave a little bit of that dissonance behind. It's, it is the, like I was saying with my, my students, the human post-it note. Give them all little pieces and force them to work it out. And themselves. it's acknowledging that multiple realities can exist within yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another thing that like a lot of education writing right now doesn't do everything. You Homework is always terrible. Always. This is always good. This is always been, like, no, no, come on. Like there are multiple realities when it comes to a classroom. And we need to acknowledge that these things exist and we need to talk openly and honestly about them. And it makes teaching harder, but it should be. It's a really hard job. And part of what I try to do with my writing is simplify pieces of it, but not oversimplify. Simplify in a way that let's have a conversation while also talking about how complex the the work is, if that makes sense. Um, and then, like you said, you podcast as a way to kind of, um, have an extended or one of the results of it is this extended reflection. That's the same reason that I write, uh, Neil Peart, the drummer for Rush, uh, because I'm a giant nerd. So I'm going to reference Star Trek and then Rush on your podcast. Um, the drummer for Rush once said that I write so that I know what I think. And that resonated with me. It's like, that's, ex- I, that I, I talk to myself out loud in my helmet on my motorcycle, and then I have to write it down so that I know what is going on in my brain. And and it helps me become a better teacher, just like the podcast helps you. Um, And then coming all the way back to your original question that you asked nine hours ago, um, the painted nails post was one of those things where I, I like painting my nails. It's fun. It, it, it's honestly, I'm a little bit ADD. So when I wave my hand and my nails are green, my brain is like, Oh, look at that pretty color that just went by. Um, so that keeps me entertained. <laughs> um, I like watching my fingers when they type because they're pretty. Um, but at the same time, it has this honestly unintended. And I want to make that very clear. It's not like I sat down to paint my nail nails and I was like, this is going to blow those kids' minds, man. This was like, my nails are going to be pretty and it's a Saturday night, so I'm going to paint my nails. And then I get to school and a student is like, why are your nails painted? You're a boy. And then that's that teachable moment. That's my brain going, oh, we can talk about stuff stuff now tell me more why do you think that i can't have painted nails because i'm a boy because girls only paint their nails what else do girls only have girls only have long hair and then they look at me and i've got you know hair past my shoulders and then they're like oh no and then it's not like this long protracted conversation about it where we have this deep meaningful thing about gender roles because I don't have the time. He doesn't have the time and he doesn't really have the bandwidth for that kind of detailed adult conversation, but he does have the bandwidth for me to hit him with those two things. And then like, I'm just going to let it stew because that's one of the best parts of teaching. Like you were saying with the post-it note thing is I'm going to, I'm going to put this inside and then I'm going to close the lid 
and then I'm just going to let it cook. And eventually you will reach some kind of a conclusion or that will be a puzzle piece that later you will read a book or you will see a movie and it will give you another puzzle piece. And then those two pieces will go join together because teaching is such a long game. Nothing, very little that we do that is super important is something that happens and then it's happened and it's done and now it's there. It's set. Every, almost everything that we do is like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And hopefully by the end of the year, most of these things will have become what I actually intended them to become. And that's, that's kind of the fun part of teaching Um, on top of, you know, how, what's a more creative way to teach division of fractions because, oh my God, nobody gets it right now. I got to find a better way to teach it. And that's not quite as long of a game. You gotta that that's that's a little bit quicker. And um, I you know it's important to, to to point out. At least it's important for me to point out that the the long game stuff that I'm talking about should not take precedence over the curriculum stuff. That's another extreme that you see so much online right now. It's like the lessons that we're teaching don't matter. How the students feel about them matter. That's no. That's insane. That's no, they they have to care about the learning. They have to care about that kind of stuff because if, I don't know if you've looked around recently, but we live in a world right now where people think that the, the, the facts don't matter, only how they feel about the facts matter. And now we have the orange menace because facts don't matter, only how you feel matters. So maybe we should not be promoting that mindset. Maybe we should be also telling teachers and students that, the things you know matter and actually learning and retaining those things matter. It's not just that you can Google it later. You actually have to know it. It's not just how you felt about knowing it. Uh, and that's very much not at all what you asked, but I get very aggravated when I think of like, it doesn't matter what the students learn. It only matters how they feel. No, that's terrible. That's a terrible way to teach. Don't, uh, uh. It's uh, I'll 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 jump in on your growls there. It's uh, I I like I don't know who dropped the quote, but it's one that gets it gets you know force fed a lot through the socials around the you know the students won't remember they won't remember the lesson they'll just remember how they felt in the lesson. And I think I'm like no, I want them to remember the lesson, but I also want them I want them to question why they're feeling what they're feeling, and I want them to continue question what they're feeling and why they're feeling it and how I was able to make them feel that or how their person beside them was able to make them feel that. I want them to be present in not only the lesson, I want them to be able to tap into their past and I want them 10 years from now to be a reflective person, maybe not remembering the lesson, but I don't know if I necessarily need them to think back and say, I really liked Clough. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't, for me, there isn't, I don't need, I uh, if I were given the choice between, um, am I a whole person? Am I a whole person in, you know, the ups and downs and the insides meeting the outside and the sort of like skills that I have, or, you know, was it that one time in that one class that I really enjoyed, you know, how Clef made me feel? Because I think if that's your, if that's one of the last positive experiences of learning, like you, you might not necessarily be a functional human. Mm -hmm. And and I think there's real risk there. And I totally get the my context, my political context is very different, but I've observed the exact same flow in relation to, you know, the politics in the States right now. I, I, I can see that. I can see why it would be cause for concern as well to recognize that both both command and the self-regulation and the respect for the facts are you don't separate the two just just to sort of feel better. It's not that the way that the lesson makes them feel is is a bad thing and and uh, that comes back to them acknowledging multiple realities uh, no they they should be enjoying learning we should part of what we do is teach them to enjoy learning and learn for themselves but they also need to know that some things exist and they need to actually know those things and i think they need to know why they don't like the learning mm -hmm. so and, and that's a very different that's a that's an immediate emotional let's say it's it's separating the am i in a good mood right now and i just happen to be in math class it's that wherewithal to say is it actually math that i is putting me in a bad mood or is it 
my distraction from the weekend? Or is it the fact that I didn't eat lunch? Or is it the fact that um, I don't, um, I didn't bring my pencil today and that stresses me out. And I think sometimes that gets put into the mix as part of the feeling good in school. Mm -hmm. And it ends up imprinting on top of a subject that it's not, it, it, the data points don't match up. Yeah. Not for me always, not, not always. So um, if my daughter were going into grade five, here's where I wrap up the painted nails. If my daughter were going to grade five, I, I would hope that she could encounter a teacher that uses the same strategies as you, where you feel safe enough to reveal the inside on the outside. And I say that um, one more compliment. I'm guaranteeing that you're coming back. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's a real truth to that where when I observe other teachers, I've even had teachers, I, I helped out. We have things, I don't know if it's the same thing, but if you're taking extra qualifications while you're a teacher, we call them AQs. So additional qualification. And I've, I've, I have, was helping out with a colleague with that. And I was talking about um, the, the frame of the conversation was how to, it was, it was about uh, lesson design primarily, but it was also, it got into bringing the personal to the professional. So how do you sort of blend the two? How do you dance with who you are, not only as a teacher, but also as a, as a human? And I had one of the students say to me quite specifically, I draw a line, I build a wall, I don't go there. My existence as a teacher is entirely separate from my existence when I'm home. And I, my only response to that, I, I said, for me, that would be very, that would be, that would be a, a hundred more times work than just being selective about the experiences that I share. And I, I observe colleagues and I look at a little bit of that lockdown thinking and, and I respect it. If that's your choice, that's your choice on how you want to teach. But I think it also sometimes leads down the path of um, redundancy and why certain courses might not be connected with people anymore because the lived and life experience isn't being painted on them. It's, it's just not bringing the story of the curriculum to life. So I, I hope my, I hope both my children encounter um, a teacher that has the strategies that, that you, as you said, it might not be intentional, but it is actual. And um, I, I hope they do too. Um, yeah. The, the, the revealing the outside the inside on the outside thing was one of those things that like in my, in my um, solipsism, in my, in my own little world that I existed in, I thought, I assumed that people did that because I can't not like, I, I could probably be a capital T teacher at school. That is not who I am. I probably could figure that out, but I would, that would suck. I would hate that. It would be, it would be no fun at all um so i just this is how i am like i don't i'm not exactly the same person but the difference between who i am in my classroom and who i am with my friends like probably comes down to how many metallica references there are and how often the f word comes out of my mouth that's probably like the main difference because i don't know how to not one of my big pieces of advice for for um new teachers and student teachers but also just when i give keynotes and when i do presentations is is be a people um be who you are be who you is is the fun way to say it um because that students then see you as a person and they they see you as somebody that they can talk to and identify with and 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 actually have a conversation with and connect with um and it, it comes back to like when i do when i do give keynotes when i do speak when i write books um when i write blog posts like the painted nails blog post probably could have written that in at a remove talked about how small changes make big things and kind of step back from that but that's not the way i teach that's not the way i process everything has to be a story all of my books are full of stories about teaching that have a moral at the end basically all of my keynotes are like actually i'm gonna get up and i'm gonna tell you about gavin that i had when i was in third grade teacher in hawaii and at the end of the story about gavin hopefully we have all learned something about stepping back and listening to what a student is actually saying 
before reacting to it. Because I, as far as I'm concerned, stories make lessons stick. And that's, that's how I communicate. That's how I learned how to communicate. So I, I have to be... I got to be me. Um, I have to be who I am. The weird teacher thing, I think some people see that as like a, a brand and it's not, it's just a lucky coincidence that the, the, that it lined up so nicely and that so many people then looked at it and was like, that's a little weird. Cause in my head, it's, it's not, I, 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 I am now far enough along that I understand that other people think it's weird and I acknowledge that. But to me, and I, this is probably true for everybody. It's, it's just normal. If that makes sense. Absolutely. And part of that, that idea of actualization, I, when the, when the student said to me, when that student teacher said to me, I, I draw the line there. I just, I felt the sword slash like across me, you know, like game over. And it was just, it was a finishing move. Cause I thought, wow, that is so not my context, but me as the AQ teacher support, how do I bring this as a, how do I sort of move this as from such an absolute frame of mind to open it up as a conversation so it doesn't directly um, insult the individual who I could tell emotionally this was a thing that they did. They did it in order to sort of make it through their day. Because for me, I think more like you, to me, to make it through the day, I need to sort of be kind of, I need to sort of be able to use multiple parts. I need to have a really big kit mm -hmm. to sort of make it through the day. And part of that kit is talking about my kids and the funny things they do, or um, a, 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 a part of a movie that I saw on the weekend, or you know, a joke that my neighbor threw down this morning while we were shoveling snow. Like those are important. Um, I, I use this before source code to sort of making it through my teaching context. In the yeah, day. and it's all it's very much about because I've. I always feel like I need to make this very clear. I'm not, when I, when I do these things, I'm not telling people they have to teach like me. I, I'm telling people they have to teach like you. You should not walk away from a conversation with me or one of my books or a keynote or whatever, thinking I want to teach like the weird teacher. I, I want to teach like who I am. And so I make jokes and Star Trek references and I'm very silly in front of my classroom because that's who I am. That is, if that is not who you are, then be whoever you are in front of your kids. I don't want to walk into another room and watch somebody doing an impression of me. That would be weird. And they probably wouldn't do it as well as I do. They need to do it like, like they would teach. And then I want to watch them and be like, wow, I could never teach like that. And the, the kids are learning and the kids are on it. And they, everybody seems, as long as everybody seems happy, you know, that's like, that's the most important thing. Everybody seems into the learning. That's what's important. I could never teach like that. That's so cool. I don't want to walk in and see you using a blue puppet because in my book, I talk about a blue puppet. Um, just whatever feels true to you is what you should be doing. And therein lies the, the simplicity of the nails. It's not telling, it's not, it's not saying that the nails is, is a new um, form of dress code. But it does open up the thinking enough that a kid observing it can you've 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 opened up the possibility that they may just have disregarded a choice. They may have just sort of washed over a moment where they could think about themselves from inside out. The, it's it's an accidental bit of permission that you've given them to not just take at face value what other people tell them. Right. So, cause that, that, you know, the feed that you threw down about, you know, well, girls do it. And it's mm -hmm. all like, that's all, that's all learned. Right. Like that's, there's nothing, there's nothing genetic about that. They, they don't, they don't, it's not like they're, um, you know, data mining into their own, uh, information system to find that answer. That, that was something that someone gave to them and it stuck. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. And you gave them a counterpoint. So I think that's, yeah. it's, and, and that, and that is, that is teaching. <laughs> whether it's whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable that is teaching um i've i'm not i'm never going to make it to i got three spaces i want to jump on so i'll we'll, i'll throw it down as a, as a multiple choice if you got you got time for you got time for one more lightning round okay so yeah for sure it's oh, your okay. podcast so you um, tell me when we're done 
power. Um, okay, so I've got um, I got I have a planet exploding here, and in the middle of it, I wrote down the new hyperbolic, and it has to do with whatevs. Or uh, I wrote down data and other forms of kryptonite. Um, or between there, I found I was I love this um article I had from a little ways back from Fast Company. It's they call it a Fast Company masterclass, and the article is actually called Nine Rules for Being Funny. But I kind of scratch and I put nine rules for being teachy, and we could do that. Which which of the three you want to jump into for the last blast? Oh my gosh! Uh, let's do the data one because that's uh, my my brain is full of that kind of stuff. Okay. This year. What what caught my attention was a, a very honest a very honest post by you talking about the data not necessarily sitting in a natural place for you. Um, I think why it spoke to me is that I'm not a natural mathematician. I kind of rebelled at taking math through high school. I could contextualize it. You know, I just, I didn't get it. I didn't like the teacher. It was the wrong time of day. I don't know, puberty. I could throw a whole bunch of stuff down why math didn't work for me in high school. I, regardless of my starting point, I think that part of me recognizing the importance and beauty of mathematics around me, not a textbook version, but just the language and literacy and fluency has led to me being kind of itchy sweatered by data. Like I just don't, I don't naturally make the connections from data that's presented. And I don't naturally have a respect for the fact that someone has collected it in the first place. Now that's my little one-sided part of the island. Where do you come at it? So my, my so I don't I don't like data. I'm not good at collecting it. I'm not good at at, at looking at it, um, which I also recognize is a weakness in in my game. Um, I should be better at it because it is a useful thing. And it, I've kind of taken that out and looked at it a lot this year. It's one of my goals is to be better at it. And my go to reason for why I don't like data is the is kind of a cliche. Kids aren't numbers. So I don't appreciate that these tests are breaking my kids down into categories and colors and numbers. And that's a very it's it's kind of a really easy excuse and then you put that in you put that in your head and you're like that's why i don't like data because it makes my kids numbers but the more honest i try to be with myself and the more i really try to hold these reasons up to the light uh, and look at how i actually feel about it the real reason i don't like data is because i'm so scared it's gonna make me see that i'm not a good teacher or i'm not as good as i think i am i'm so scared of looking at numbers that reflect that the things that I'm doing in my classroom that I think are good are actually not. And I, I, I really think that's the reason that I have this allergy to looking at data is because I'm scared. I'm like a flat earther scared of proof about a satellite that goes around the planet. I, I, I think that might be part because I'm very invested in my kids. Are, we're not just going to take tests. We're going to make stuff. We're going to read a book. And then to talk about a character, I'm going to give them a bunch of cardboard and paint and they're going to make a thing. And that's going to show that they really understand the, the stuff about the book. And then I get the data back and it's like they the data shows that they didn't learn what you said they were going to learn. And it's like, well, then the data is bad, man. But what if it's actually that my lesson was bad? And I, uh, I'm actually not good at this. And so that's, I think that's where I'm at when I look at this stuff more honestly, is I'm afraid of it showing that I'm not good at this. And I think everybody kind of feels like that when you look at data, because you always get that, at least that one piece of it's, it's, it's like, um, I don't know if you've ever given a keynote or when you speak or something and like you're on a roll there's a thousand people laughing and one person not. And what is that guy's problem? And how come I, he's not, what's wrong with what I'm saying that he's not laughing. And I feel like it might be the same with data. Sometimes like, I, oh, my classroom environment is good and my kids are learning and they enjoy coming to school. But that number that, Oh, what, what's wrong with that number? Uh, and you obsess over that. 
Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, that experience. So sorry, that speaking in front of people, totally get it. Totally get it. Especially where I'm even laughing and crying on the inside, enjoying myself so much. And then it's just like, and it's like, you see that one person and it could, you might just have caught the mid burp, right? They're trying to hold it, you know, that's right. Flip the script from their point of view. They're like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. I have gas right now. But you at the, up at the podium, you're like, that guy is like holding his mouth. He doesn't want to show that he's happy. Um, so I totally get that part. It's the second part is I've never sat at a table. I have never sat at a table. And maybe this is just the effect of you and I talking like this and it's the rapport and the safety and all that other kind of yakety yak, but I've never sat at a professional development session where someone at the table said, I'm actually afraid that the data is going to show data data that I'm a bad teacher and that I'm making mistakes. It's usually offloaded to the system that the system is off track or they say, but this, whatever assessment you used is faulty. That must be what it is. It's the actual assessment tool that you're doing. It's not that it wasn't taught, right? It's not that the kids didn't get it. It's that in-betweener space where the actual net that you're using to catch these things, the holes are too big, they're too small, they're the wrong shape, they, whatever. So I think there's a really interesting space to explore that conversation yes. um, because it's, 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 it's nerve wracking. If the, if, if you come at it, like you are playing a part or you can't play a part in dancing with the actual data and, and then what do you do? Like where, what's your, cause then it's not about you just getting better at understanding data. If you actually get the answer, you actually get the answer. It's not about that. You go back into your toolkit or you go to your corner and, you know, come out round two. What does that look like? Do, do, has anyone, have you, have you had many of those professional conversations within your school or, you know, in your region or district where teachers are openly saying, you know, I'm concerned that it could reveal the problems in my teaching. So that's the very personal pedagogical toolkit that the teacher has. No, we don't say stuff like that's not a thing you say. Um, um, and I, I don't even say that like, this is the first year, the first, not the first year, the first school where I've felt like I have these, I have an administration in place that I am comfortable enough having those kind of conversations. I, I love my principal and she's never going to hear this. So it's okay. I don't think she listens to podcasts. So I, you guys know that I'm saying that without like trying, I don't know what she would get. She would give me if she knew that I said that, like kind of, there's not really anywhere you can go. Once you're a teacher, you're like, yeah, I'm doubling your salary. I can't do that. Um, you get extra library time. Woo um, but you can't actually, because we have a very complex schedule and I can't give you any more library time. Um, I'll let you get away with another one of your crazy ideas is probably all that would happen, which is really all that I want. Um, but she's so open and friendly and lets me play and lets me take risks. And then as long as I can articulate them and explain them to her, and as long as she comes into my classroom and my kids can articulate what's happening, she's okay with it. So this is really the first year that I've, felt comfortable enough to like sit with my principal and talk about data like this. You know, we have those professional evaluation conversations and she's like, what is one of your goals this year? Uh, I'm bad at data. Um, and I don't think I've ever explicitly yet told her, I'm scared that the data will show that I'm not good at this, but it, it, it is part of what I'm feeling, but I don't think that's a thing. Teachers, you don't talk about, you don't talk about weakness. You don't talk about failure like that. It's kind of like, I don't think, uh, I don't think baseball players talk about striking out all that much. I don't, that's probably not a, maybe they do. Um, I, I don't think that football players talk about the time that they lost the game. Oh man. Do you remember when you got sacked? That sucked. <laughs> Who? I mean, some Belichick probably does it to them and that's probably why they're the best team in football and have been for 20 years. Um, but I, I don't know if everybody does that. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, you know what? Though, let me pause on that though. That there's that other, yeah, the, yeah, there's, but you will watch that game tape over and over mm -hmm. just to continue that, that idea, which you may not willingly go there, but you may be forced to go back and watch the tape. Yeah. And that, that, that creates that interesting kind of, uh, that tension that, you know, 
that's it. That's the accountability piece, right? And you still might watch the tape but not necessarily understand how you could have done it differently. And watching the tape of yourself teaching, that's another thing that like being a mentor teacher is kind of the same thing as is like that's isn't that the that's oh my god, having to watch yourself speak or teach is so weird and hard because you're like oh my god is that really what i said is that how i did that i've been standing there for like five minutes and i haven't stopped talking why didn't anybody stop me oh god what are my students doing right now look at that kid why is that kid doing that how come i didn't see that no no (laughs) there's evidence (laughs) there's it's on tape it's on tape Wow. Um, so yeah, it's I, I I don't know, and maybe I'm being hard on myself, but I really think part of my allergy to data is more that I'm scared that what I'm doing is not working, and it will explicitly show that, and then I will have th- then the imposter syndrome will become even stronger. Do something. something else, so quick. here's the thing that I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> tell you. I don't definitely. The new hyperbolic apath- apathy versus entropy and the whatevs. That would be a low. That would be a low moment to leave this podcast on. But I'm just, I'm going over this, the nine rules of being funny that I've done. Well, what is, what do you mean the new hyperbolic? Though? Um, I'm, I'm, well, that was. I like the picture, but I don't know what it means. So it's, it's, it's that, ex, that extreme response, that sort of heightened response that can just be encapsulated with the sigh or whatever. Oh, okay. So it's in the, op, it's in the opposite end of that where kind of you you have a hard time it's almost like i don't even have i I don't i can't even i can't even get to that space and there was that idea of you know if if we can start to say whatever i I was i'm now grasping for the statement that you said is you know it's the common it's the common line that people often say is the worst thing that you can say about education and i think you countered and you sort of said no sort of the, the feeling of nothing the whatever is the is the kind of the worst position. Uh, I, I don't remember what you're talking about. Yeah, I wanna I wanna throw you a compliment in a different way, but it's more, I think, just what came out of this conversation. So those nine rules of being teachy or funny, we've covered them, which it was sort of kind of accidental. One of them is failure is the only option. So the rules of being a teacher or the rules of being funny. Second, get personal. I think we touched on mm-hmm. that too. Number three, actually I'm putting numbers, there's no numbers, I'm just saying the third one. <laughs> Figure out what works then change it. Yeah. That's I, I wait, I want to talk about that third one. So, figure out what works and then change it. We have to be constantly um and I know that it's got like a hashtag and a brand name, it's growth mindset and blah blah blah. But you got to like you're constantly breaking what you do. And I think that's one of the really neat challenging things about teaching is I know this works, but I also know that next week it's not gonna or next year when there's new kids, it's not gonna. And I also, um, as, as a writer, as a creator of things, I understand iteration and drafting. So I understand that it works now, but then I'm going to, when I rewrite it, I'm going to write it better. I'm going to write it differently. And that's the same as that's, that's very similar to teaching. I, I'm not going to teach this exactly the same next time, even though it worked the first time I have a different group of kids or they're in a different place, or I'm in a different place. I have to continually be breaking what I'm doing because through breaking things, you make them stronger. And I think that's 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 a big part of that one. How about this one? Look back, move forward. Um, I like look back, move forward. You gotta, we, you should know where we're coming from. You should know what is, and that actually that that goes back to the data thing, right? I'm scared of looking back. I'm scared of looking at the data and what I've done, but I have to continue to move forward regardless of of that fear and of what that might mean, and use that move forward. How about this one? Being liked is overrated. Now I got. I'll bring this back. So now remember, these are rules for being funny. These are, and it's uh, David Soderberg and uh, Larry David and someone else. Like this was part of a conversation. They say here are kind of the rules for doing comedy. So failure is the only option. Get personal. Figure out what works, then change it. Look back, move forward, and now this one: being liked is overrated. Um, I agree. Uh, it's yeah. Um, and both in the classroom and in the more 
professional learning network sense being liked is overrated. I, I want my kids to like me. I want them to like coming to school, but I don't, one of my biggest fears when I am teaching is when a student who's in fourth grade or third grade says, I really want to be in your class next year because part of my brain goes, why? You don't know it. All of you, all you've seen is the blue haired teacher in the hallway. You don't know anything about Mr. Stevens and Miss Halligan are fantastic fifth grade teachers. They're so good. You should want to be in their classroom, but you don't, you only see me. I'm, I stand out. Um, so I'm, I'm always a little scared that kids like my class too much. And I, I that's probably a ridiculous statement. Um, but then, like, I'm also not married to my class liking me. And that's a conversation that we have. Like, you guys, we do, we have fun in here, but we do not have to. That is not part of learning. It's not a must. It's It's certainly helpful. But it is not a must. And every year my class responds really well to that. It's not a threat, but it is like I'm putting this reality out here because every year, kind of around now, you know, they start to start feeling their oats. My kids are fifth graders. They're almost sixth graders. They're almost done with elementary school. They're starting to look towards middle school. The, the hormones are starting to fire up. We start having really specific issues. They're like, come on, guys, we got to you cannot like being here. You're still going to have to be here. Um, and I would rather them not. And then as far as the being liked is overrated thing in a professional context, it is so easy, so easy to write tweets and blog posts that make everybody nod and everybody's like, that's a great idea. But really, if you're being honest with yourself, all you're doing is regurgitating the exact same talking point over and over and over. You're taking the safe path. You're saying the safe things. Even when you're talking about risk, you're talking about risk, but you're saying it in the safest possible way. You're using the safest possible medium. You're using the safest possible picture. I'm going to talk about risk and I am going to show a guy bungee jumping. Okay. That's not a real risk. He's not going to die. He's not going to get hurt. He's going to be scared for half a second and then he's going to be fine. That's not a risk. Show me a guy going 200 miles an hour on a motorcycle at a 70 degree angle in a turn, scraping his elbow on the tarmac. Now we're talking about real risk. Now we're talking about what you actually mean. People don't like, cause then I'm, it sounds like I'm making fun of them and I'm not, I'm just pushing back. I'm challenging. No, I did. Part of it is I've reached out to individuals. I've, I've had those part of it is the, the optics, sorry, the, the data, the data, I always forget the analytics of having lots of likes is it skews in whatever direction you want to, you want to swing it. Right. So part of it is if, if, if someone, you know, the fact is there's a person plus there's a product that's being liked and you don't ever get to ask the question, is it all the stuff that is just shared that's liked or is someone just, you know, is right. automatically hitting the heart because they know the person. So no, I, I get that, that, that in between asking the questions, it, it, it shares equal space or equal air with all those other likes. And, and why is it still like, like, okay, this one thing was good, but this other thing that is tangentially related is not, why are we giving it the same air? Why are we giving it the same space? Why aren't you pushing back? And I think part of it is like, because we have to be nice. We have to be polite and pushing back is rude. Um, and no, it's, it's, it's how we get better. You need to honestly assess each other. And that's me opening my, I'm perfectly okay with somebody telling me that my stuff is wrong. Um, I will, it will still hurt. It'll still sting, but it's an actual conversation rather than like, you know, sometimes when you see like those real generic tweets and then it's got 9,000 retweets and 17,000 likes, but it's only got six responses. Yeah. And all six of those responses are like, yes, exclamation point. I totally get that exclamation point. Like that's a bad tweet. For education, that's a bad tweet. That's not – why aren't we having a conversation? Why is there no conversation? Why isn't anybody actually interacting with It's true. I see the exact same thing. I, I And when I even think back, I think back on my own tweets that didn't generate – didn't sort of move into a conversation mode. Um, some of them I've pulled. I'm like, you know what? That's just me putting my 
blackout for no reason. You know, it didn't generate conversation. I couldn't get to a second layer on it. So let's let's clean that one up. Okay. I want this to be representative of of what was sort of like a, a, a grind to get conversation going, not just like how many attempts were made at sort of sharing things. Again, of the, the multiple realities is this. I totally put stuff out there that's like that. Um, but I also understand that that's not the real goal. The real goal is to put stuff out there that promotes some kind of, I want to talk about, even if it's like, sometimes it's just like, I'm going to put out, I like this thing in this movie. And the real reason is not because I want to tell people how much I like this movie. I'm really hoping that somebody else is like, I like that movie too. And now we have something to talk about. And now we have a baseline. And then later when we start talking about teaching, we already have this established relationship because we both like Spinal Tap. You know? Yeah, exactly. No, I totally get it. There's four left. I'll throw them down. Let's see which one you want to bite on. Okay. <laughs> the second one is kind of our, the next one is kind of ironic considering we're at like hour nine. I know. Hey, so you got work the silence, misery loves, and I actually wrote down teaching, comedy, education. Listen up and don't pander. Yeah. Uh, don't pander. Oh, uh, let's, uh, the others are good, but let's do don't pander and then we can get out of here. Beautiful. Um, Let's wrap it with don't pander. um, It's it's the most important thing that I learned when I started uh, writing and creating things is is, uh, not to go looking for your audience. I'm not trying to get to an audience. I am trying to create things that other people will resonate with. And what that means is my audience is not as big as other teachers who write and create and have generated themselves an audience. But, and I'm not saying that they do this and I don't. I understand that what I do is much more niche and much more specific than what a lot of other people do. But I am not trying to create something that makes people nod. I'm not trying, when I, when I write, I'm not sitting down and thinking, what will my audience want to read about today? Why am I getting readers? I'm sitting down and thinking, what do I want to talk about today? And, I hope that somebody will I will I will be able to communicate that in a way that even if they don't actually care about the topic they will talk they will read it because it the way I communicate it is interesting or entertaining um so I'm not trying to I'm not thinking about what they do and then i think that goes with our our students too they don't don't pay when you're teaching it's the, there's an old simpsons bit because everything can come back to the simpsons where the guy sh- i think it's the simpsons oh god maybe it's family guy what if i'm confusing the simpsons and family guy i might lose a nerd card um you know what i think it is a family guy routine Shoot. um where this guy there's an assembly and the the guy running the assembly takes the chair on the stage and he spins it around and he sits down backwards on the chair and he takes a baseball cap and he spins it around and like two of the kids in the audience are like hey wow he sits just like us we should listen to him it's like, that's i'm not trying to do that i'm I, like when i when i know things about my students lives or what is hip to the youths I will bring it up, but most of the time I'm wrong. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Like when the Pokemon Go thing started, I wasn't all about, I'm going to make Pokemon Go part of my lesson plans because I don't know anything about Pokemon Go and I don't really care. And I'm not being like a curmudgeon about it. I'm just, they can have that. I don't need to make that educational. I'm okay with them having a toy um, and it just being a toy. AKA make it unfun. Right. That's sometimes the thing. Sometimes. Sure. We don't I don't have to absorb that into the uh, educational, the belly of education to make it unfun for you now. Right. So don't don't pander to your kids. Kids are sharp and they see red. You don't actually like my little pony. Why are you? So when I talk about my little pony, I'm always like so. And I just start making up names. So like when skeleton horse and and hoof master fought with. Do, do they have horns and wings? To, uh, so they flew, and then and and then Star Lord showed up, and they're like, "That's a different movie." And I'm like, "Quiet, Star Lord showed up." That's awesome. That's awesome. But it totally works. Plus, it creates that mashup of confusion. Which, hey, back to where we started. <laughs> there's, there's value in mashups. Exactly. All right. Where can people find you? Where would you like to be found? So people are reaching out. 
Uh, they can find me on the tweets at the weird teacher, and then that's a really easy um, baseline to start from. I, I accidentally branded myself, and now it's everything. So I'm on the Twitters at the weird teacher. I'm on Instagram at the weird teacher. Uh, Instagram is going to be a mix of my classroom and my kids and just selfies because I'm super vain. Um, uh, my blog is he's the weird teacher dot blogspot dot com. Um, my books are all on Amazon. If you search Doug Robertson, then you're going to get two results. You're going to get me and you're going to get a guy who makes videos about making your butt look good. I'm not that guy. I'm the other one. Um, I'm the books. He's the weird teacher of the teaching text. You're welcome, which is only 99 cents an ebook. Uh, cause I price all of my books for teachers. It's insane that teaching books cost $25 in paperback. That's insulting. Teachers don't make enough money to be charging $25 for a teaching book. Uh, it's a little soapbox, um, a classroom of one and, uh, the unforgiving road. Those are my four books. Um, you can, where else can you find me? You can find me on Facebook, um, where I don't, uh, really, if you're following me on the other pieces of social media, you don't need to follow me on Facebook. It's just, I don't post anything original there. It's just links to the blog posts. Um, you can find me at my house or my school. <laughs> can you imagine I have, it's, it's someone like <laughs> people just knocking on the door. I would door. be like down and tracking um, you to the nth degree. And then just as one little more little thing, I, I started a side project with some friends recently because talking about, and this kind of ties back into what we were saying, talking about teaching all of the time, because that's kind of what I do is a little exhausting. And I feel like, um, sometimes I run out of things to say or ways to say them different. So I started a website where I write about music with friends and we're calling it ear protein so it's ear protein uh, dot wordpress dot com and it's just a place for us to because i love music so it's just a place for me to write about music do album reviews talk about music videos that we like or why this album is good just kind of coming at it from a fan's perspective uh, with a couple of other friends and it's kind of a nice like way to scratch an itch where i want to be creative and i want to be writing but i don't have anything else to say about education right this moment about something or I, I just want to write about something else and in writing about something else that will strengthen my education writing which is my bread and butter and my, my teaching you know you, you can learn so much about teaching by not actually teaching and by not actually thinking about teaching I believe so if anybody's interested in music writing it's ear protein uh, dot wordpress dot com that's cool I totally agree I love going outside the bubble to sort of see more about what actually makes up the bubble so yeah cool man thanks for giving me your time thank you for having me and for for letting me go on and on and on hey you know what it's still and and the offer comes down the pipe too like there's there's more there's more that uh i feel like we could chat about so if i stay connected i'd love to set up another another chat somewhere down the maybe closer to summertime or something have a follow-up combo yeah Absolutely. Well, enjoy the rest of your uh, enjoy the rest of your your Sunday, and uh, take care of yourself, man. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Chasing Squirrels podcast. You can find other episodes on iTunes and on Podbean. If you ever want to connect with me, you can reach me on Twitter at Chris J Clef, or you can reach out to me, Chris J Clef at gmail.com. <laughs>